Yes. And it's right where Frederick Barrett said it would be. It's a section of the actual iceberg damage. Okay, let's get in there real tight and frame it up. An elated team savors the discovery. You can hang there, zoom in. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I give credit to Stoker Barrett because he said he saw the, the, the uh, seams open two feet above the foreplay, and that's where we are. Okay, Ron, uh, request is that you get the ROV as close as you can to that opening. Upon closer inspection, the damage is telling. As suspected, it's not a puncture or a gash, but rather something more simple. A separation of steel plates. The plates should be held together by rivets, but rivets are missing. Some scientists have long suspected that rivets may have failed upon impact with the iceberg. When the iceberg came and actually hit the ship, at the seams, the rivets could be failing. And by failing, we essentially feel that what would have been happening is the heads of the rivets would have been popping off. Okay. Once they pop off, the seams can open, you can have water coming in. Okay. The question is, why would those rivets fail? Start right at this dab. Yeah. Before Magellan is called back to the surface, it scours the ocean floor looking for loose rivets. Yeah, I couldn't get more than about 20 or 30 degrees. Using the ROV's robotic arms, the pilots collect a steel sample with rivets still intact. See if I can hold still and let it clear up a little bit. Maybe get it under and just hold it up. The sample is carefully placed in a retrieval basket for the long journey back to Ocean Voyager. Seven's on the cage, bending it, backing up. Okay, you ready to pick them up? Yeah. All right, secure lights, hydraulics. Okay, lights, hydraulics down. Got boom. The following day, Weiss begins his work by thoroughly photographing the specimen. Next, he carefully removes the rivets. He'd like to know why they might have failed. At the time of Titanic, ships were held together by rivets, not welds like they are today. It's estimated that more than three million rivets were used to construct Titanic. Each beam, each piece of hull plate was attached to the ship by rivets. Titanic's rivets were made of wrought iron, which is essentially a mixture of iron and a substance called slag. At the time, it was difficult to monitor the mixture of slag and iron. And if too much slag was added to the mix, it could actually weaken the rivets. Investigators would like to know if this is what happened in Titanic's case. In a temporary lab aboard Ocean Voyager, Tim Weiss continues the search for answers. First, he cuts a cross section to look inside. Weiss collaborates with material scientist Tim Fakey, 
who's testing more rivets at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Maryland. It was Fakie's past work that prompted further study of the rivets. We sectioned two failed rivets that were recovered in 96, and looking at them metallographically under the microscope, you could see that the rivets had too much slag. So what we wanted to do in 1998 was to get more rivets from different places on the ship. Working together, Fakie and Weiss examined rivets of all sizes, rivets used in different applications. They're measuring the quantity of slag, which is seen under the microscope as dark streaks. Some rivets have the optimum amount of slag, and the substance appears as little round particles. This sample, on the other hand, has too much slag, which will weaken the rivet. In their work, Fakie and Weiss continue to see variation in Titanic's rivets. We've looked at rivets that are from various locations on the ship. Overall, 5 to 10 percent may be having a problem on the ship. We've looked at 30 out of 3 million rivets. So uh, we're never going to be able to say definitely, but the trend seems to be there. The more rivets we look at, it doesn't go away. Fakie's work raises provocative questions. Were small, flawed iron rivets Titanic's Achilles heel? Or was the impact forceful enough to compromise even the strongest of rivets? We may never know for sure. In any case, we now know the damage that sank Titanic was quite small. I think psychologically it was just unbelievable that something so small could have caused the loss. It had to be seen as catastrophic, and, uh, and, and that was the perception of the day. Um, now, with, with hindsight and looking at the evidence, it's entirely possible for ships to be lost with, with quite small holes that can't be controlled. For Bill Garsky and David Livingstone, the investigation is off to a successful start. But the work for these two men is far from over. The weather for the expedition so far has been very cooperative. Gentle swells make daily commutes a pleasure. These motorized boats, called Zodiacs, are a critical link between ships at sea. Today, expedition leader George Tullock heads to Ocean Voyager to discuss the weather that lies ahead. Conditions can change very quickly here. Hurricane season has officially begun. And the Titanic site lies well within a known hurricane zone. The team is keeping its eye on Hurricane Bonnie, which has the potential to hit the site with devastating force. See, this has shifted before it was coming. Bonnie will have to be watched closely. How's it going? Much further north. Deep below the surface, the conditions here are still ideal. For the past several days, Paul Mathias and the crew of Nortil have been capturing the most detailed photographic record yet of Titanic's stern. Going to sharpen up the, uh, the exposure. I'm going to open the shutter. 
Nautil has the ability to move very, very precisely over the seabed. And while we're moving back and forth,